Hello, my name is Phil Smart and I'm the Assistant Policy Manager with the Rail Freight Group. Very warm welcome to everyone and we hope you've had a good Easter break and are ready to begin the new term with, our third, with the third in our series of technical talk lectures. Featuring Ralph Goldney of Rail Freight Consulting, who will be joined by guest presenters from the rail industry. If you missed the first two of these covering wagon design and how a locomotive works, the good news is that these have been recorded on our YouTube and can be found on the RFG website. This webinar will also be recorded and available later if you want to, uh, to go over any, anything that you didn't quite catch. So having learned about traction power in our last lecture, we now look at how this power can be used and look at rail loading and track access charging. So whether you've had a lifetime in the industry and are looking to refresh your knowledge, or if like me, you always feel you've got a lot to learn, then we hope that you will enjoy uh, the next hour or so. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A as they occur to you, and we'll try and get round to as many as possible. So it's now my pleasure to hand over to Ralph Goldney, MD of Rail Freight Consulting, who is joined this week by Alan Aitken from Wabtech and Dr. Mark Burstow of Network Rail. So now, Ralph, over to you. Thanks, thanks, Phil. Uh, Yvonne, Maggie, um, is everybody in that's, that's coming? Should, should we start? Yeah, I think. Yeah, just yeah. start. Yeah, just start. Okay. Well, well, thanks, folks. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Thank you for. I hope you find this interesting. We're, we're going to talk about bogies, bogies, and um, accessing the rail. Uh, the sort of journey that we've been through from 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 this, which isn't so old, but some some put images will be much older, to this mo modern wonderful thing. And, and on our on our on our journey, we're going to be. Um, Guided by Alan Aitken, who's the head of engineering at Wabtec, um, who's had a lifetime in this, this area, and uh, Dr. Mark Burstow, slight slight typo in his name on, on the screen, but it's with you, Dr. Mark Burstow, who's from Network Rail. He's a technical fellow there, and he's the principal track vehicle track dynamics engineer. So Alan's going to go through bogey technology, how that works. Mark's going to talk about how we turn that into the track access charge. I'll, I'll just say a couple of slides at the end about. Uh, what that all means and a little bit of a comparison with road. Okay, so with no further ado, uh, Alan, do you want to start off? Yes, good morning everyone, thanks for joining. Uh, <clears throat> just like to talk slightly through um, the bogey development and what we've done over the years where we've trans transferred basically from a friction dump suspension to a, a viscous dumped um, suspension system. Where you can see on the, on the left of the um, the diagram shown um, TF25 type bogey, which is our primary bogey that we um, we use in the UK at, at this moment in time. Um, it's a viscous damped suspension, and you can see and generating all the, the various um, components of it. Um, the, the key components from a viscous damped suspension is the, um, the primary suspension damper, uh, the radial arm, and the, the radial arm bushes that attach it to the, uh, the side frame. For example, for the difference on a, a Y25 damp suspension, which we call a friction damp suspension, it's basically the, you've still got the primary suspension nest, you've still got the, the axobot type idea, but the damping is, is produced through what they call a linear link in a, a friction damper. It's basically a steel on steel friction damping system. The, the linear link transfers some of the vertical load onto the axle box friction face to provide vertical and lateral damping. Completely different system from a viscous damp, which basically utilizes uh, a tailor made um, uh, damper. So that's the main components. What I would say is the Y25 type bogey, still regularly used, it's the, Euro, it's the European bogey of choice um, it's still there's still thousands and thousands produced each year it's um the only difference that we but we've, we've taken it in the uk is we, we've tried to go away from um the friction damp to introduce the the viscous damp for the added uh, advantages of uh, controlling how the the loads are passed from vehicles uh, onto the rail so i'd like to take you to the next just before we leave, Alan, just to say yes. TF25, that stands for Track Friendly 25. Sorry, yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, the dark green name on the TF25, it's a substitute, as well. I call it a track friendly bogey. Um, the reason behind it, the, the track friendly is, is again, as what we said with regards to the design, is to to reduce the, the loadings that's imparted into the rail, hence the, the idea of um, track friendly. So the picture in front basically shows you the, the differences between the two um, bogey suspensions when it's running on rail. And if you think of the, each bogey type uh, running over a vertical track irregularity, it basically the suspension moves vertically. And the idea is, is how quickly you could damp the suspension from that uh, irregularity to, to reduce, to get back to even running again. So when you look at the left-hand side, that's the, the key um, components of the um, TF25 bogey, the viscous damped bogey, where it has um, a softer primary suspension compared to the, um, the Y25, which is stiffer. And the reason that it has to be stiffer on a Y25 is that the lateral stiffness is key on those springs to control the um, lateral damping of a Y25 bogey. But anyhow, the difference is being soft primary versus a stiffer primary. What happens there is because the softer, you've got a softer primary um, suspension, you've got, you get a lower frequency response when you run over the track. Hence, when you look at the diagrams there, you've got the, the green one, which is sitting below the, the two value where the, the red one uh, increases above the two. And all that is, is a, an acceleration of the vehicle when it's running over a track regularity. But, but Alan, for acceleration, we can really uh, use track, tra the load that goes into the track, uh, more or less. This, 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 this recognises the load that's going into the track. That's the load that's going, that's the acceleration for the vehicle going into the rail, that's correct. Yeah, yes. so it's about the amount of, simplistically, it's the amount of up and down. So it's that's the up and down. They are trying to keep everything as a vertical movement and what's happening with the with regards to the suspension or the wheels coming in contact with the rail. So what we can see here is that the, the, the damping, the more effective damping on the TF25 is smoothing it out and keeping it lower. That's correct. Whereas this is much more, it's bouncing around effectively, isn't it? The, yes. The, because of the lack of it. Yes. Right. And, um, and, and, the, and the key aspect of using a, a viscous damper is you can optimise the rate of the viscous damper um, to, to suit the the, the, the wagon body that's sitting on the bogey. So if you've got a higher mass wagon bogey, you, you could change the, the characteristics of the damper ever so slightly to optimise the best performance um, running. You could, you could do the same as such on a Y25, but not to the same um, degree of accuracy because you're relying on friction. And as you know, friction changes from, from the weather, from the climate, from the, the application that's running on. So you can change it to suit ever so slightly, but not to the same degree you could do it on a, a viscous damp suspension. And, and Alan, just talk us through primary and secondary suspension. You've mentioned primary, so let's just... just right. mention. So the, the, the primary suspension is basically the suspension springs that sits above the, um, the, the radio arm or the axle box. So if you could see it on the radio arm, the primary springs just sit directly above the axle. That's the primary springs. And the, the primary suspension on that side is damped by the vertical damper to the side. So that is your primary suspension. And if you move to the Y25 side, the primary side that you can see the, the primary suspension springs. And then if you just go to the left there, Ralph, where you had that angle, that's the, what they call the lunar link. That's what controls the, how much friction is getting passed from the, the side frame into the axle box. So that is your primary suspension of both types of bogies. The secondary suspension is to the top where it connects with the wagon body. On our TF25, that is a, a metal elastic stack which keys into the, the vehicle. So it's controlled by um, um, the characteristics of the rubber. So if you get a lateral movement, the, 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 the rubber absorbs that. If you get a longitudinal movement, the the um the rubber absorbs it on the Y25, which you can basically see it's basically a spring spring that sits onto a, a friction face. And what happens there is that the, the, the wagon body comes into contact with that. And when it's in uh, a lateral movement, 
it will either rotate on that friction face or it will um, compress the, the spring on that friction face. So uh, the, the work to the same idea is, is just there's more control on the rubber stack, which is on the, um, the, the, the TF25. But I'll show that in a later slide. So effectively, we've got two degrees of freedom. The primary suspension is between the rail and the bogey. And yes. The secondary suspension is between the bogey and the rail. And vehicle. the wagon and the real vehicle that sits on okay. it. Final that, thing while we're here, great. Alan, let's just talk about unsprung mass because that's really important in rail, okay. isn't it? And Mark will talk yep. about it. Mark will uh, give you the, the, what happens when unsprung mass later. But basically, the unsprung mass of a vehicle is based on the mass that sits under the primary spring. So any any mass that sits under the springs that are shown there, that is classed as unsprung mass. So for example, the wheel step, the bearing, and the, the axle box or the radial arm all combines, and that is your unsprung mass. The sprung mass is then everything that sits above that primary suspension. So that will be example your your side frame, your, your your bolster, and then all the all the wagon detail above that. So that's how you class the unsprung mass versus the, the sprung mass. And that's really important because effectively unsprung mass has got no suspension protection at all. It is literally the hammer that's knocking the... Knocking that's the correct. Uh, and the, the whole goal is, is, is if, if you can keep the, the unsprung mass as low as possible or practically possible, depending on the application and what you're carrying loads-wise, then the lower the unsprung mass, the better your track access... Um, okay charging feature will be as, as a key element in the in the calculation of um for track access and why this is a track but, friendly bogey yeah also yeah. alan just 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 for people's benefit just for, as as of interest you can see that the tf bogey has slightly lower wheels uh, smaller wheels than the, the y series bogey and that means that the deck height can be slightly low lower and you wouldn't think that's important but actually it's it's really really critical with intermodal wagons because it's much easier to get uh <clears throat> uh, high cube containers using this bogey than the Y bogeys. Yeah, uh, just just as a general on that, Ralph, the um, the TF twenty five bogey shown on the left there, that has a wheel diameter of eight forty. It's an eight forty diameter, uh, specific specifically de designed to try and keep the unsprung mass um, lower, but also helps from a, a noise side of the vehicle running as well with the with, with the smaller wheel. It's also designed to to meet the requirements of 25 and a half ton axle load. Whereas the standard size on a Y25, we'll get, it's, um, it's a 920 diameter wheel. So slightly bigger, which makes it slightly heavier, depending on, again, all depending on the, the application that you're running with regards to axle load loading. So just taking it forward from a, a steering side, and this is another key important factor for the, uh, the viscous damp suspension or the TF25 bogey. The TF25 bogey is an optimised wheel set, yaw stiffness. And when I say yaw stiffness, it's basically just the, the capability to be able to, to move in a position to go around a rail. Um, we, we class as a yaw, it's like a snake in effect, but it, it moving one way, basically getting the wheels into position when it's going um, around the curve. So the, the whole purpose and, and function of the, the Y25 bogey is, bogey is to utilise uh, the radial arm design. The radial arm uh, increases the capacity for the for steering, so it improves the uh, flange-free curving. And what I'm trying to say with flange-free curving is that when the, the vehicle or the bogey is going round the rail, it's not, the flange of the wheel is not coming into contact with the, with the rail. We, we try to limit how much contact we're getting with flange and, and the rail. Um, <clears throat> the difference with a, a Y25 is that, that it's, it's restricted in how much movement it has between its axle box and um, side frame. So that, that restriction doesn't allow it to have a completely flange-free flange curving. So when a, a Y25 type bogey is going round uh, the rail, it, ho it has more flange um, to, to rail contact. And it's this rail, co this contact, that's what gives you the increase in uh, wear uh, on 
on the flange, on the wheel, and also to a certain extent um, on the um, on the rail as well. Uh, and what we've found over the years, but we've where we've monitored the performance of um, both types of bogies that typically on a, a TF25, we we're we're getting a wheel profile running around about the 180,000 miles mark before we have to reprofile. Whereas the, the Y25, again, depending on routes and whatever, averages around the, the 80,000 mark. So you can see there's a substantial uh, uh, increase uh, with regards to wheel life uh, by running the um, the viscous damped suspension tailored to, to basically give you the, the performance from a, a curve inside um, from a vehicle um, design. So let me just reflect that back. Uh, I, I can see here that we, we, we're showing a, 0.23 degree here and a 0.14 degree here. So the radial arm, this 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 um, this this linkage here, that's correct. Yeah, allows the the wheel. It's got a little bit more flexibility in this bush, this joint here, and so it's able to stay sort of parallel to the rail a lot better, reducing the flange. Uh, and this is flange wear, and this is a really significant thing because actually. Uh, <laughs> Wagon maintenance is largely driven by replacing the wheels as they wear down. And so, you know, actually you're, you're reducing your your wheel cost, your maintenance cost by almost a third here. So it's, yeah. a, it's a big deal, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, and that's the key aspect um, with regards to why the, um, the, the TF25 was um, was designed, but also, you know, with, with regards to being track friendly, it's very key on performance of um, wheel life. Uh, and it's all focused around getting good um, wheel life on on the vehicles. So basically, we talk, we talked about primary suspension, and then I just want to try and give an overview of what we say as the the secondary suspension or the the lateral control um, on the vehicles. And um, the two pictures below again they show the the, the friction damped Y25 on the left and the, the TF25 um, type suspension on, on the right. Um, on a Y25, the, basically the, the, the secondary suspension is controlled by the shearing. When I say shearing, it's the other one. Um, sorry. Ralph, sorry. On the, on the Y25, it's controlled by the shearing of the primary springs. So any uh, when a, a vehicle runs over a lateral um a lateral kick or you know any disturbance laterally it's the shearing of the springs that absorbs the acceleration that lateral acceleration Oops, sorry. <clears throat> primary spring and what happens is that the center connection is basically a spherical connection and the vehicle rolls from middle to end, depending on what. So the, the side bearer springs, Ralph, which if you could show the side bearer springs right in the middle, that's the, oh, the, right. those two there, but over just to the right slightly, that's right. it there. That's the side bearer spring. So when that vehicle rolls, that spring will either compress or increase. And that's how the secondary suspension works on a, on a Y25. It basically it, it rolls onto that spring, compresses it when it sees a lateral movement. It also, it also when you're curving, it, it crosses that surface and control by friction. But the key aspect from a lateral side is that, that either it just it just rolls on and off that spring, and the lateral is taken up on the the, the primary suspension. When you move to the TF25. Um, idea you've got two rubber stacks that's keyed into the to the, the wagon main body so those two rubber stacks when you see a, a lateral acceleration or a lateral movement the basically the, the the rubber the rubber shears but when the rubber does shear and move there's a lateral damper that's connected to the, the wagon body and that absorbs that acceleration and basically reduces that acceleration very quickly because of the of the lateral damper. So again, depending on the application, the lateral damper is um, it can be tailored to suit what the requirements is um, for uh, the the mass or the mass or the of the body of the vehicle. So again, we've got more control and um, controlling with regards to the lateral suspension 
that control was all geared to, to reduce the lateral accelerations, hence the lateral forces uh, going into the rail. So again, it gives us more control. And it, uh, again, it's all to do with the benefits of um, maximising your, your real life, real, uh, real to rail um, forces, et cetera. And also, Alan, I, I guess we this is important when you introduce a new wagon, you have to do a, a dynamic gauging assessment just to see how the wagon performs when it's wobbling around. Yes. What, 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 what we do now, there's, there's, a, there's a software package, a dynamics package that's um, has been developed um for the for the UK basically and we use it which is called a vampire um, a dynamics package. And what we do now is we produce vampire models of every vehicle before we um, go to manufacture anything. So when I say about optimizing the um, the vertical damper, lateral damper, all that is predicted by using um the, the dynamics software. So we we we've got we we practically know where we're sitting from a design side on the vehicle before we have to go to, to manufacture. There's been a lot of work and advancement on the, the Vampire to the stage now where we can get good validation from Vampire results to, to actual results. So from a confidence side, it gives us um, you know, a much uh, credibility uh, uh, with regards to what what we're going to see from a level of um, track forces, vertical accelerations, et cetera. And we do that all up front before we start cutting any, any material, any metal on the, um, the bogey design. So just, just slightly on the manufacturer and the, 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 the pictures on the, the right hand side, they, they, they're all TF25 uh, viscous damp um, suspensions that are running on the, the UK network uh, at the moment. They're, Tank wagons, bay, petroleum wagons, aggregate and coal hopper wagons, all been running. I mean, the first TF25, just got to say, was introduced to the UK back in 2000. So it's, it's not like you say it's a new bogey design. It's been running for a lot of years now, proven, proven in service. But again, it's all tailored to, to suit the, 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 the requirement of the, the wagon it's going to be used on. And it's very so, much a European supply chain, isn't it? And because of that, it gets affected by... Covid and Ukraine and all kinds of stuff like that. Now. Yeah, I mean, where we're where we're placed at the moment, um, the TF twenty five is 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 manufactured in um, Czech Republic. Um, there it's um, we use a manufacturing plant in Czech Republic to 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 manufacture the manufacture and assemble um, the bogey. All the ancillary components like wheel sets, brakes, dampers, etc., they're all sourced through our um, European supply chain that then gets fed into the assembly uh, assembly manufacturing place in Czech Republic, where the, the complete bogey is, is built uh, and tested. And then the finished bogey is basically supplied to, to, the, to the wagon build, build, builder for direct fitment um, to the wagon. This could be anywhere. It could be, I mean, uh, again, at the moment, we were doing... Uh, a lot of work with um, Green Buyer, but also a lot of work with W. H. Davis in the UK. So I mean, it's we're placed to work with anybody. That's the idea. Or we could supply supply the bogey uh, to to any country from 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 where we're getting it. Um, and final question, Alan, just roughly, how many how many of these are produced a year? Depending on the market, um, Ralph. It's a very cyclic market, unfortunately, how we're working. But we last year we produced four hundred bogies, and um, this this year we're predicting maybe two hundred. But in our peak years, we were anything up to a thousand bogies oh. per year. So it's very it's peaks and trough with the, the market. What I will say is the market is the UK market. These bogies are just running in the UK. It's for the UK. It's it's all designed to take advantage of the the track access charge and that um, Mark's going to speak about. Uh, um, later, um, and, and that, that that's why the the bogey uh, was designed. It's it's certainly for to 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 help the 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 UK market, and that that's where it runs. Okay, thank you. Well, that's really really great overview. Thank you, Mark, uh, Alan. That's that's really helpful. Uh, we'll move on now, um, and uh, Alan will be able to answer some questions at the end. And if you've got any, please put them in the chat. So we'll 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 pass over now to to Mark. Uh, over to you, Mark. All right, thanks, thanks, Ralph. Hello, everyone. Um, so, yeah, so I think Alan's 
talk there about the difference between the Y25 and the TF25 hopefully gives you a, a, a good idea and maybe a bit of a background about um, some of the things I'll be talking about in terms of track access charges. So um, yeah, access on the GB network, um, everyone has to pay a, a track access charge and it, it's a, actually a very complicated thing in that it's made up of lots of components. Um, and one aspect of it is known as the variable usage charge. So this is not the whole of the track access charge that train operators pay, it's just one aspect of it. And it's the variable usage charge. And the reason it's variable is that it varies from vehicle to vehicle, depending upon the characteristics of the vehicle. The reason why it's, uh, it varies from vehicle to vehicle is that it tries to reflect the cost of the wear and tear caused to network rails infrastructure by the operation of vehicles. Um, so yeah, every time you, you, you run a train over a piece of track, that track deflects uh, or experiences some wear, like Alan was saying, when the vehicles are curving. And ultimately, at some point in the future, that's going to require some maintenance intervention to go and fix it. And that's going to cost money. So the idea is that all the users will pay a proportion of that maintenance cost um, in, in proportion to the amount of wear and tear that they've caused to our infrastructure. Um, so, yeah, vehicles that, that cause more wear and tear. I used the word damage there. I don't like the word damage because it makes it sound like you're actually going to break it. But uh, wear and tear is a better term because it is just a small incremental change. Those that carry uh, do more wear and tear will actually incur a higher charge. So, if yeah, if you go to the next slide, that shows how it's split up really. Um, so. What happens is that for each control period, Network Rail puts in a proposal to the ORR as to how much money it actually needs to maintain the network. The ORR come back and there's a bit of an argument about how much money we can actually have. Um, and part of that money comes as a direct grant um, from, the, uh, from the government. And the other, what well, the remaining part, is what we recover through track access charges. And again, so the variable usage charge is one aspect of that. And then we also do an assessment to work out how we're going to split up that variable usage charge, that recovered part, uh, into different areas. So as you can see there, there's like a, a bar chart in the middle there. So some of it covers signaling costs, some of it covers uh, civil engineering costs. So that's mainly under bridges, uh, embankments and culverts and things like that. Um, and then the large proportion of it is on track. So that's track geometry maintenance, track renewal, uh, grinding, uh, repair, repair of defects like rolling contact fatigue defects and renewals of rails and that, that sort of way. Um, it's probably important to say the signalling bit is only 5%, but that in itself is actually made up of two separate bits. So there's a fixed bit to the signalling and a variable bit to the signalling. And that sort of recognises that actual signals themselves don't wear out the more you use them. They've just got a, a fixed life. So every everyone just pays a, a fixed amount um, for the signalling. But there is a variable bit for signalling as well, because signalling includes things like point operating equipment. And obviously, as you run more trains over a set of points, you're going to wear it out and require renewal of the point operating equipment. So some of it, it depends on the traffic and some of it doesn't. Um, in terms of the tracks, the track bit itself is also split into two sections. So if you think about um, the directions, there's a track bit which is vertical. So a lot of the vertical loads and the impact loads that happen on the track, which cause deterioration of the, the geometry and failure of the ballast underneath the rails, that's one aspect of the course of the charge. And then there's another bit which is referred to as the horizontal damage, which is the, the, the surface damage that the rails experience through wear and rolling contact fatigue and squats, which really comes out from the ability of the vehicles to curve. So as Alan was saying, the TF25 bogey curves better than a Y25. It's good for the vehicle. And if something's good for the vehicle, it's usually good for the track as well. So where it extends, uh, wheel life using something like the TF25 that also has an impact of causing less wear and tear when it's curving on the rails so it, it'll incur a, a, a lower horizontal charge. Um, okay yeah if we move on please. Right. Just before we leave Mark just just yeah, yeah. I just want to clarify that the, the VUC and, and track access 
um, you, you said that the VUC is one of the charges. I think in, in freight, uh, the VUC, this variable user charge, is, is all we pay. The difference is with the passenger uh, franchises, they actually pay a big lump sum as well, don't they? So, so in this, we're talking here about the VUC, and it's quite interchangeable with track access charges for the freight community. Is, is, that, is that right? Um, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure what other fixed yeah. charges yeah. freight operators pay. That you, you probably need to talk to our economics no. people about that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I only get involved in the in the variable aspect, but yeah, certainly the passenger operators pay, um, you know, a premium for particular timetable paths. And, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. So they don't. So yeah, that's fine. So that I mean, actually, so when we talk about track access charges just for our audience in the freight context, this is the, the majority of uh, of what we're talking about. Uh, and uh, that, that's very helpful. Thanks, Mark. Um, okay. okay, another question. I forgot what it was. But okay. Okay, move on before Ralph remembers it. Yeah. So, really, the next bit is it is to try and give you a bit of background as to how we actually determined how the VUC is split up between each vehicle. So, effectively, we've agreed the total pot of money that we can recover through operating trains, the total variable usage charge. And we need to find some way of apportioning that to different vehicles based on their track friendliness or their, their particular characteristics of the impact they have on the track. Um, so to do that, we used um, a, a model, the Vehicle Track Interaction Strategic Model, VTISM. I'm sure some uh, of the audience will have heard of this. It's been around for a few years. Um, it was an industry developed model. And it was really developed to try and, and get a better understanding of the economics of what happens at the wheel rail interface, recognizing that vehicles, when they run, cause deterioration to the track, but also poor track can actually also cause deterioration to the vehicles. So it's a better understanding about how they all fit together and trying to find what the optimum economic part of that actually was. Um, so, uh, a few years ago, we used this model, or well, we engaged a, a consultant to run this model for a large number of vehicles. So we could actually understand how parameters such as speed, axle load, and unsprung mass, the impact they had on our track maintenance and renewal costs. Um, and that, so the, the, that VTISM model has got in it all our unit costs for going out and grinding the rail, fixing the rail, renewing the rail, or renewing the whole of the infrastructure. Um, so the model was used with a range of vehicles to try and see how costs vary as a function of each of those individual parameters. The results of that are on the next graph. That's the one. Um, so a whole series of, of graphs, and there were many more simulations done that are just presented in this graph. But these show you for each of those parameters, the sort of costs and, and how they vary. Um, so the, the numbers along the bottom are basically the speed. Uh, so the first one, the first set are for 25 miles an hour. The next set of numbers in each index um, are for axle load. And then the last one is the unsprung mass. So you can see or you can pick out from there how um, things like unsprung mass, speed and axle load actually affect um, the costs or, or the, the maintenance costs for the infrastructure. That's really Mark, it's, it's worth just saying that we, we can't control the speed or the axle weight, but actually the unsprung mass, when you're looking at a, um, when you look at a reasonable speed, you know, there's sort of uh, well, 20% additional wear um, based on the unsprung mass. And this is moving from, I think, three, what's the one ton to three ton, isn't it? Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. it's quite important, isn't it? Yeah, so it, it, I mean, the real impact on freight there is you can see that there is quite a big uplift in all of them, apart from the high speeds, when you move up to a 25 ton axle load. Mm. Um, so any anything you can do to improve track friendliness when you're operating at higher axle loads will, will, will be to your benefit. So those relationships were then all, all Put together and a series of mathematical functions were fitted to them so that we could interpolate between those and then determine what it was for any and then these it, it, 
at the, at the relationships which were actually determined, which we now use for determining each component of that variable usage charge. So there, if you look for the track one, the vertical component of track, there's a quite a complicated formula there, but it's a function of axle load speed and unsprung mass. The next one, the horizontal one, that was a separate exercise to report it here, but really looked at the ability of different vehicles to curve. What was Alan was talking about with the TF25. In terms of damage and wear and tear to underbridges and culverts and, and embankments, the civil function there, it's a bit, it's a bit simpler. Um, and then the, just the split of the signalling base. So half of it is fixed, but the other half of it is a proportion of the, of the track vertical uh, damage function. And I guess the implicit message here, Mark, is that there's a, this isn't just made up. There's a lot of research that's gone into supporting the uh, the, the VU. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, the, the big message here is that actually there is some science that sits behind the VUC and how we allocate it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so in terms of the uh, horizontal components, so the, the uh, rail wear and rolling contact fatigue term, um, Alan was talking very well about the, the radial arm uh, in the primary suspension of the TF25, which is what gives its good steering ability. And that's a very good introduction to what we do here. So what we look at is the curving ability of different vehicles with different suspension stiffnesses and different suspension designs. And we look at how the forces change as you run on tighter and tighter curves. So the graph in the bottom left-hand corner there um, shows on the, on the y-axis, it's showing effectively the, the steering forces that the vehicle is generating and how on all vehicles, they all increase as the curve radius tightens. So as you move towards the left of the curve and the curve radius gets smaller, the forces go up, which is what so you'd expect. By the steering forces, you're effectively talking about the horizontal forces. In the yes, plane. yeah. So the, the wheel rail forces that are in the plane on on the top of the rail. Yeah. So yeah, basically the shearing forces, which actually cause wear on the either on the top of the rail or onto the, the flange. And as I said, that's what's going to be wearing the wheel out as well as what's wearing the rail out. So if you can reduce those forces for the rail, you'll also be beneficial for the wheel. Um, and so we get a whole set of curves for different vehicles. And then we translate those into the, the component of the VUC, which is the graph on the right-hand side there. So it shows effectively how the primary yaw stiffness changes along the x-axis. Um, so that's effectively the stiffness or the resistance of the primary suspension to actually trying to guide the vehicle around the curve. And on the y-axis, it shows how that turns into a cost per vehicle mile in this particular case. And so the vehicles with the stiffer suspensions, so towards the right hand side of that graph, will incur the bigger costs. And anything you can do to make the suspension softer and make it steer better will reduce that cost. Those numbers are quite small. You know, you're talking about three, four or five pence per vehicle mile, but they quickly mount up when you're yeah, running and, a large fleet of vehicles over a, 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 annually over 100,000 miles. Yeah, so I guess perhaps using the example that we've talked about before, the TF bogey would be in this space here, would it? It's even further wide. left, actually. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, and yeah. Why, the wide series bogeys are up here, are they? Um, Probably not as far across as that, but they, they are further towards the right-hand side. Yeah. yeah, and so we're looking at a difference between maybe one and a half, two, as against four or five. Uh, and so, you know, this is this is where it's such a big deal, yeah? Yeah. 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 Okay, thank you. Okay, so those are sort of the the um, the main components or the bit of the science behind how we set the VUC. For most people, um, most operators who need to set a VUC, it, that's all a bit too complicated. The actual process itself, I hope, it comes across as being a bit simpler than that. So the VUC itself really depends on four things that are related to the vehicle. One, it's axle load. Secondly, it's unsprung mass. If you remember, Alan was talking about the higher the unsprung mass, so the higher the mass of the vehicle that's actually impacting directly on the track, that's going to do a lot more damage and higher impact forces. So you would expect that the charges to have to increase with higher unsprung mass. The bogey primary yaw stiffness, so that's effectively the plan view suspension stiffness, and it shows you or gives you an indication of how well the 
the vehicle is actually able to curve and therefore a softer suspension will give you better curving and less wear. Um, and also the speed, you'll see, remember from the, the other graphs that the speed has an impact, the higher the speed, the bigger the impact forces you're gonna get. In terms of freight vehicles, unfortunately, the operator hasn't got a lot of control over what the operating speed is. Um, so in terms of the calculator, what's happened is that when you apply for a rate, you, there's a list of commodities which are uh, sort of pre-populated uh, and you choose which commodity you're gonna be operating in. And the speed is actually set according to your commodity. And those speeds have been devised basically from the timetabled average speeds for trains carrying those commodities. Um, so the train operator or the freight operator has no impact over uh, or, or no influence over what the operating speed is. That is just set beforehand by what the choice of the commodity is. In addition, though, there is, for freight operators, there is a bogey discount factor which is applied. And this reflects the dynamics of the bogey and its impact on the track. Um, if we go on to the next slide, Ralph. Yep. Before we leave, uh, Mark, just, um, so I, I, when I was preparing this with Mark, I, I didn't realize this. And we'll show you some tables of the wagons by the commodity type. And, and actually, um, Network Rail have, have really gone to town here and looked at the average speeds. So maybe, I don't know, let's think of an example, maybe a car train might run faster than an aggregate train. And because it runs faster <clears throat> with the same axle load, it puts a slightly higher load into the track. And so it's got a different VUC, and this is how it works. And we'll see this coming back a bit later. Sorry, thank you. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so back to the bogey discount factor. So if we, if we consider uh, a variety of of bogies, we may consider that, as Alan was saying, the actual ride of the bogey and the forces and the accelerations which are imposed on the track depend a lot on the actual suspension of the bogey itself. So you may have bogies which are carrying the same axle load and have the same unsprung mass, but because of their design, they perform dynamically different. So what we do is we assess, or we have assessed each of those bogies and for each different designs, applied a different discount factor which is a strange term because they're not all discounts. Sometimes they, they actually amplify it rather than give you a discount. But it's a, a factor which is applied to the vertical component of the uh, that damage function um, to either amplify or reduce it depending upon how track friendly that particular bogey is seen. So there are two things a user can do when they're applying for a rate. They can either use one of the pre-calculated rates and I'll put the table in the bottom right hand corner there. So there's bands from zero to seven. Um, so bands one and two are basically for two axle vehicles. Um, band three is a three piece bogey. That's a pretty basic sort of bogey. Um, and yeah, dynamically it can put a lot of force into the track. So it's, it's pretty basic. You then move to the through things like y, the Y25. So the basic Y25 is a band five bogey. And band six, so the TF25 bogey actually sits in band six because it is deemed to be more track friendly than the Y25. Um, so you can see there that the Y25 gets a, a, a discount factor of 0.938. So 0.938 is multiplied by the, the vertical uh, VUC number, if you like, whereas for a TF25, it's 0.898. So you actually get a sort of an extra small percentage discount, 5% discount or something for operating a TF25 bogey. Um, for users who have got an, a novel bogey or they don't think that these discount factors uh, or their bogey sits well within those descriptions, it is possible to do a bespoke calculation for what's known as the ride force count. And um, there is guidance on our website as to how to do that. And there's a piece of software that you can download. It basically involves someone doing a vehicle dynamics simulation of a vehicle running over a piece of track and will supply you with that the, the geometry of that piece of track. And then the software gives you an analysis of the forces which that vehicle has created in running over that piece of track. Um, and determines what the what the discount factor is. So um, that's 
quite commonly used for people with more modern bogies who want to um, sort of exploit as far as possible the improvements in ride that you get with more modern bogies. Uh, but if not, you can, users can just pick the closest one that they've got to the in, in the table there. Mark, we'll crack on a bit, shall we? Just running yeah, the... yeah, next one. Yeah. So really, that's all sort of the background. This is actually about the process of what we're actually doing. So you can download the VUC calculator from Network Rail's website. Um, it's a spreadsheet. You open it. It runs a series of macros. And first of all, you'll get this, this basic input sheet here where you can input the data. Um, so you can, oh, sorry if you go back a bit, yep. Ralph. Um, so it's populated with all the existing vehicles. So you can choose a vehicle from the list and just say it's that one, or you can enter the details for a new vehicle. But you enter, so like there's a, a, a number of boxes sort of in the middle of the screen there where you input the vehicle weight, the number of axles and the unsprung mass. There's a, a drop down box. You can choose what the curving class is. So that's basically what the primary yaw suspension is and how well is it, it is at steering. Again, you've got the option that you can use a vehicle dynamic simulation to assess the steering capabilities. And if you click the little box that says user defined T gamma, you can input the results from a, a vampire simulation and get a more accurate calculation. And then in the Towards the top right hand side there, you've got the suspension discount factor. And again, you've got the list of the, the pre-calculated ones, or if you've used out the stuff where they downloaded from the, the website, you can input what the ride force discount factor was from that. And then underneath that, you've got the list of commodities and you can check or you can click, you can click one, you can click as many as you want. So you could evaluate the, the, the VUC for a vehicle carrying absolutely everything. Um, and then the most important bit circled in red in the bottom right hand corner is the panic button. Um, if you click that button, unfortunately, it comes up with a little box that says, this is Mark Burstow's email address. Huh. Um, so <laughs> go and hassle him. Anyway, when you click the go button, it produces an output sheet like this. So in the top section there, you've got all the details of the wagon. So it gives you a, a summary of the data that the user input and then underneath what the actual VUC is for that vehicle. Uh, for a freight vehicle, that's always in pounds per thousand gross ton miles. Um, okay. okay, so that's that's the main VUC calculator. Um, in response to some feedback we had um, through the ORR and various meetings, we had a consultation. If you go on to the next slide, Ralph, um, we also generated something else which is available from the Network Rail website, which is referred to as the Ready Reckoner. And this was a sort of a simplified version of that calculator, but it's just a spreadsheet where you can just populate each of the rows at the bottom of there with different vehicle characteristics. And it was deemed as an easier way people wanted to be able to compare what the effect of, uh, of choosing different vehicles or changing vehicle parameters would be. Um, and rather than rerunning the calculator for each variant of a vehicle, you could just in input all the data into this spreadsheet and see the results instantly. Um, but I must say that if you are applying for a VUC rate, you must use the proper calculator and print out the, uh, the results sheet that was on the previous slide. This is just for people to, to be able to test and see what the effect or what the VUC would be for different vehicles. Thanks, Mark. So that's, that's really great. So I think we've given quite a lot of detail now and you can see that this, this we, we could talk for several hours on this. Um, there's a huge amount of science uh, and development work that's gone over on for several control periods of getting to this, this figure. So actually, what does it mean in the end? Well, what, what we see in the freight team is, is a series of tables that look like this. On the left-hand side, this is the, the locomotive table. So uh, as Mark was talking about, we've got, this is the 60 uh, and part of the 66 table. So you can see with the with the 60, we've got a whole series of commodity specific charges, again, related to the average speed of those 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 commodities. Um, and it's interesting that we can compare the the, the different uh, charges per locomotive type. So I've highlighted here for construction, a 60 uh, pays uh, five pounds per thousand gross ton miles uh, and a 66 pays just less than four pounds. Uh, and that recognizes the different uh, suspension characteristics, all the stuff Mark's talked about earlier. 
so so actually we can see that that actually the track access charge for a 66 is around 20 percent less or more than 20 percent less than than that for a, for a 60 um, and that's i guess hopefully you're recognizing a bit of progress so so that's good and we, we can see the same thing with with the um with wagons so i've picked up some intermodal wagons here at the top this is quite an old uh tfda which is a which is an old older bogey carrying sleepers uh, and we've got figures loaded and tear uh, and i've picked out the loaded in 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 uh, domestic intermodal four pounds per thousand ton miles this is the, the latest generation of uh, eager frets uh, freightliner vehicles uh, and you can see here that that the the track charge goes down to 1.7. So this is really, really um, significant decreases. And I, I guess I'm just, just talking about it from a financial point of view, but, but of course they directly reflect the forces that are going into the track. Uh, and this is a direct result of the work that Alan's team at Wabtec have done. And you can see how the track access charge for these vehicles has halved o over time. The FDAs aren't that old. Uh, I was behind in choosing the FEAs in, in 12 years ago and even since there the, the, the price has come down so you know actually there's, there's great progress being made and this is what we see and so the focs will get charged based on kgtm which is really confusing so every time i say kj you think about kilograms but it's actually thousand <coughs> gross ton miles uh, and finally just how important is this in the broader scheme of things so this is a a cost model for a uh, for a for an aggregate train middle of the main line down to London, carrying 1,400 tonnes, sort of three pound a tonne type, type stuff. Uh, and you can see that the track access charge is 12% of the total cost. Relatively short haul on longer hauls, the track access cost um, can be more. On, on shorter hauls, it's less. It's obviously it's linked to the, the distance of the, of the route. But you can see the track access cost is 10 to 15%. So you can see here, if we're halving our track access cost, it really, really is making a significant difference to this end price that the customer pays. So this is really, really important. And this is how it all holds it all together, you know, actually. Finally, just a, a little comment on, uh, on the cost comparatively. So as the freight community, you can see on this train, broadly we're paying 700 pounds to move 1400 tons of material. So it's 50p a ton. That's what we're paying our infrastructure manager net network rail for, for the maintenance uh, of the track. And it's important to recognize, Mark has made the point that, that actually freight doesn't pay all of the costs. We're not paying for the actual provision in the first place, the capital provision. And actually there's direct grant going in there as well. It is it is subsidized, it's worth remembering that. But even so, 50p a ton. Now, this is a bit rough and ready folks, but I've just compared that with, with road. Um, I've taken the highest rate of HGV, uh, 850. I said that we, they're going to give deliver two 20 ton loads a day. So you you do all that and it's eight and a half P a ton. Now, don't hold me to this. It, like I say, it's a bit rough and ready. But the point that I, I guess I'm making is that the price rail freight pays, the subsidized price rail freight pays for their infrastructure provision is significantly more than it's paid for, for for road and i think there's some economy of scale there there's a the fact that road is road repairs are paid through a variety of different mechanisms through you know council tax through to straightforward taxation but actually this is what we're up against this is the challenge this is the challenge and you know actually for these heavier trains we can be economic because our fuel costs are much lower than road but this is the bottom line this is where it all comes out and it's really why <laughs> We've lost a lot of business over time. Okay, there we go. Uh, we questions now, folks. Um, Phil, do you over to you? Is that all right? And I'll stop sharing. Yeah, great. Thanks, Ralph. Um, we've got a couple of questions that have come in. Um, I'm not quite sure about the first one because it refers to comparisons between the bogies taking into consideration the same power and torque from the electric motors. Uh, that seems to be a question to me, to my understanding anyway, that might apply more. If we're looking at, um, say, a multiple unit situation where you've actually got motors on the bogey, but um, yeah. have I interpreted that that correct? Maybe it was uh, from someone who hadn't sort of realised what, what 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 we were looking at. But is there a is there an issue to cover there? 
perhaps while you're thinking about that, the um, well, we've got a well, well, Phil, let's just try and calculate it. I yeah, mean, actually, okay. you know, actually, all of these bogies are powered by electric motors. Um, 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 I, I mean, Mark, perhaps you could help us here. I, I don't. I mean, we, we, we're, talk, we're talking about wheel slip situations here, and I don't think wheel slip... Well, so I'm, yeah, I'm not sure we are, actually. I think because the accelerations that Alan was okay. talking about are basically the accelerations that it experiences as the vehicle runs over track alignment features, yeah. Yeah. and not necessarily the longitudinal accelerations you get from traction and braking. So I, I think it's important not to get confused between the two, that this, I, you know, I think what Alan was talking about was not necessarily traction and braking forces, it's just the shocks that the vehicle sees as it as it runs over track alignment features you know over s and over rail joints and just uh, yeah exactly it's all it's all trailer bogies that we've been discussing here there's no power bogies mm -hmm. being discussed it's just ha what happens when the vehicle's running over the rail when you get a, a vertical irregularity or a lateral irregularity it's just how it performs you know to to reduce those accelerations it sees when it's when it's running of course, the point being that the power is applied from the locomotive, and we've been talking about wagon bogies here, which aren't powered. Yes, correct. Yeah. And the other question I think came in um, again while Alan was talking was about how is the increased potential for wheel set hunting controlled? Um, an example being given the conflicting requirements of your flexibility for steering versus your control for stability. Who wants to pick that one up? <clears throat> With regards to instability, how, how how we deal with instability, as I said, we, we look at the um, the performance of the vehicle through um, vampire dynamics. So so what what we are doing is we we're running the vehicle over a predicted um, predicted track through um, dynamics, and then we're looking at the um, potential for hunting. When when we when we identify hunting, then we look at the again we have to look at the the damping rate. The, the spring rates, the um, you know the everything that, everything that we use for getting a good performing vehicle, then we'll we'll um, we'll tailor our characteristics to to minimise the um, the hunting effects or eliminate the hunting effects as best as we can. Okay, um, I've got a couple of things that occurred to me. One is that if you've got a very long train. Uh, going around a curve, are the lateral forces on the leading wagons uh, greater uh, than on the rear? I, I would have thought that if the if you think of the locomotive trying to pull something around a curve, uh, the, the the wear on the leading um, the, the leading wagons are, are, are experiencing a greater lateral force. Have I got that right or wrong? Uh, that's great. Uh, I mean, sorry, carry on. Uh, I, I was going to say, are you thinking in terms of the the wheel rail forces, yes. the steering forces? Yeah, because that's so the, or, or, in, or, or the the tendency perhaps for increased flange content contact. Yeah, because there's um, a greater lateral force trying to push the wagon across. Yeah, the reality is that there's not really that much of a difference because the primary suspension is so much stiffer than the secondary suspension. And the secondary suspension is like stiffer than what's happening at the inter-vehicle couplings. That actually the vehicles don't necessarily know what's happening and how many vehicles are behind them or in front of them. And the, the bogey gets very little guidance from what the vehicle in front of it is doing. There is a small amount, but on the whole, the steering is actually occurs as if the, the vehicle is a lone vehicle and not attached to anything else. So there's not yes. that much difference that occurs down the length of the vehicle. Uh, yeah, so I could understand the the, the vertical component uh, being about uh, the amount of mass on the on the wagon, but the the, yeah. the lateral movement seemed to be something that could be affected by how long training was. Yeah, but there's right. there's, there's not much interaction that way anyway. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I just think uh, perhaps on a concluding uh, note, as we're getting near to the end, um, Ralph's um, comparisons with road. Um, it's always been said that as a motorist, I'm subsidising uh, the lorry uh, who does. Uh, a lot more damage to the road surface than than I do. Um, so um, I think perhaps if I can thank uh, Ralph, Alan and, and Mark, um, and don't forget that if you'd like a copy of the slides, uh, please let us know and we can uh, we can get them sent on. Um, so I guess um, 
the only thing for me to do is to give a couple of parish notices. Firstly, Ralph, you've got one you want to uh, announce. Well, just to say that there's a CILT um, talk on the delivery of a Phil Day, a Phil Day, a Phil Alston from Day's Aggregates. He's going to talk about the delivery of aggregate into the southeast and the whole supply chain. So if you have a look on the uh, CILT website, I think it's the 18th of May. Uh, Phil's really got a great insight into rail, but also road. And this whole modal choice thing will come out very strongly in that. It should be very interesting. Right. So there'll be another chance perhaps to plug that uh, on the 18th of May, um, because uh, the 18th of May also happens to be um, the, the last in the series of these uh, lectures when we're looking at uh, uh, the intricacies of railway signalling. Um, other events to look forward to include uh, the National Rail Policy Webinar on the National Policy Statement for Road Rail, uh, road rail and Rail Freight. That's, to, that's uh, a, a planning policy document. On the 16th of May, we have a webinar on freight research in partnership with the RSSB, looking at the latest developments in our pathway to decarbonisation. Between the 13th and 15th of June, we have a pavilion at the multi uh, multimodal at the NEC in Birmingham. So if you're going, uh, come and join us, come and give us a, give us a wave. Um, for RFG members, our first digital technology and innovation forum takes place in Sheffield on the 15th of May. And on the 23rd and 24th of May, we're holding our members spring meeting and barbecue in Southampton. Also field diaries will be our popular awards evening on September the 7th for which entries are still open until the 26th of May. And full details of all these events can be found on www.rfg.org.uk. So um, thanks for joining us. And thanks once again to Ralph, Alan and Mark. And we look forward to seeing you again sometime soon somewhere. Thank you.